My name's Mark. I get to pastor here. It is an awesome, awesome privilege. Good to see you all. Uh, you know, the other day I saw a radio for sale. It was one dollar. Only had one problem. The volume was stuck full blast. Yeah. So um, I decided to buy it anyway. I, I just couldn't turn it down. Hey, I'm Mark. I get to pastor here. It's awesome to see you all. <laughs> hey, so I have a question for you. That question is, what is your longest ongoing relationship? What is your longest ongoing relationship? Who, who is the person or the people, besides now besides your parents and brothers and sisters and family members, who, who do, you, do you have some friends that you have known for a long, long, long time? Yeah? Do you have some of those people? So I, I'm very privileged. I grew up in a neighborhood. Well, okay, wait. That sounded really bad. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it just like that. I am blessed that in my life, I grew up in a neighborhood where some of the people still hang out with each other and still, and still talk. So when I was in seventh grade, I know that was a long, long time ago, I moved into this, this neighborhood in Thousand Oaks called Wildwood, and Wildwood was this, was this uh, really cool neighborhood and up-and-coming, kind of trendy, whatever place. And there were a whole bunch of people that moved into that neighborhood about the same time. And so there were lots of people my age group that I got to meet. And so, so there, were, there was Bob and Ken and, and Art and Kenny and Bill White, I mean, all these guys. And so, so as, as life has gone on, we've, we've done some things together, and, and we've kind of stayed in touch with each other. I was in, in Bob's wedding when he got married, and it's, 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 been, it's been really great getting to, to do life. Well, we got a call a few weeks ago from one of the guys he was in town. He lives in Oregon, and he said, hey, I'm just passing through. Had to go to Boulder for some reason, and uh, just, just wanted to see you. Well, I've known this guy, seriously, for, for a, a bunch of years. I mean, I know where I'm from California. I can't do the math right now, but uh, I, you've probably heard me tell stories about hobo country. I don't know if you remember any stories about hobo country. Well, that was one of the places we used to hang out. It was uh, way back when, when when, before everything was developed, there were all these huge orange groves out in the, out in the hills, and uh, that was one of the places we would go, was this, was this one orange grove, and they had uh, some abandoned houses in the orange groves, and, and, and we called it hobo country because vagrants would live in those, in those houses. Anyway, Ken called up the other day. He was like, hey, can I come over? I was like, yeah, sure, you bet. So we had a little breakfast with him, and, and Brock said... Hey, I've heard about this place, Hobo Country. I don't know that it's true. I don't know that it was real, but did it really happen? And Ken was like, yeah, absolutely, all of it. And so Ken uh, told his kind of side of the story, which was actually pretty darn cool. So, so long relationships are a good thing. Knowing somebody for a long, long time is a really, really good thing. Well, we're going to look at that a little bit today. So if you have your Bibles, flip them open to Acts chapter 21, we are looking at verses 1 through 16. Verses 1 through 16. Now, before I read this today, let me, let me just say a few things about all this. Now, as a church, we're going through this book, and what, what I'm discovering as time has gone on is, is there are so many different kinds of styles of, of uh, stories going on in this in this, uh, in this book. So like at the very beginning, there was all sorts of interesting stories about the early church, how the, the disciples changed from being just disciples to being the ones that would carry the message. We were introduced to different people. We saw different disciples doing different things, going to different parts of the world. We've seen all sorts of people interjected into the story, and now we're in this really interesting section towards the end where, where it's, it's really just a whole lot of travel, a whole lot of uh, just story, the little things going on here, 
And so it might look or sound like as I'm reading this today that, that man, how, Mark, how, how are you going to get anything out of this that will teach us? Or what redemptive story is in this? Or, or what can I learn about God as I figure out how these people are going on these boats and travel and, and all of those things? So, so like I said, 21 verses 1 through 16. So I'm going to read this to us and then let's see what... The Lord does with us with this. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we went out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patara. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria we landed in Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. Finding the disciples there, we stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied, uh, accompanied us out of the city and there on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went on board the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven, who had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in, the way, uh, in, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. After this, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Mason, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. Let's pray. Father, I ask that as we go through this story, this part of the third journey of Paul and, and others that that there would be something for each of us, that there would be a message, a word, a lesson, a tidbit, something to ponder, something that will help us, Lord, to be more like Jesus. Father, I ask that your word would come alive in us and through us. Lord, we love you today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So going back to the very beginning, another, another kind of confusing thing about reading the Bible after we had torn ourselves away from them. So a long time ago when this was written, there were no chapter and verse breaks. It was just all one big writing. So the story above is when Paul was with this other group of people. They, they wept as they embraced him, kissed him. What grieved them was that his statement was they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship after we had torn ourselves away from them. You see how it just really just kind of flows together. So just to kind of help you once again with, uh, with this story. So this is Paul's third trip. This third trip goes from about 53 A.D. to about 59, roughly. So about six years, five, six, maybe even seven years. Started in Antioch, went up here, went across, Tarsus, went across through some of the cities that, that they planted churches in. 
Here they were at Laodicea, went to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum. So a lot of these cities are the ones mentioned in the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3. Then they went up Troas and went across by Bo over to Neapolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, went down to, to uh, actually they went this way on the ocean. Then they went to Corinth, then they went back. So here, they were at Miletus. This is, that's where our story starts, right here. So then they traveled down the coast, and they went down here to Rhodes. This is uh, one of the islands that they were talking about. Went to Patera, went around Cyprus. Cyprus was on there. They went on the south side, then they went to Phoenicia. So this whole bit that we just read goes all the way from this city all the way to here. So that's a long time. Now, you got to remember something, friends. They weren't on the Norwegian, like, Carnival Princess cruise ship. All right? These were very rugged, very old. Well, they, of course they were old, but they might have been new. But they were very rugged ships. They were not comfortable. They were not, they were cargo ships for, for, for the most part. I mean, they just happened to get on board, and, and who knows where they would have slept or hung out. Uh, there wouldn't have been room service. They would have had to have brought some food with them in order to eat. But that's, man, we, you know, we read over this, and we think, oh, yeah, piece of cake, get a tan, go, go, you know, order whatever you want, hang out on the, you know, do the slip and slide on the ship down to the, to the pool. No, this was rugged. This was not easy. So I was, as I was reading through this section, it was really, really interesting. Um, somebody made a, a comparison between Paul going to Jerusalem and Jesus going to Jerusalem. And how in this particular section right here, there's all sorts of similarities. But when they say, you know, the Lord's will be done. Jesus said that when he was in the garden after he after he, was, after he came in Jerusalem, how they get there. There's even uh, some, some language here uh, when it talks about, after, in verse 15, at when we got ready, the idea there is, is it's, there's, there's like horses or donkeys involved in that. So when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he came in on a donkey in kind of a similar way that, that Paul uh, goes into Jerusalem. So really, really cool how how there's some similar... Now, we have to remember that Luke is the author of this story. Luke also writes the book of Luke, duh. And so when Luke writes about Jesus coming into Jerusalem and Paul going, there, there, it must have been you know, fresh on his mind. Some of that had to have been going on there. After we had torn ourselves away, so all this traveling, all these different places... After sighting Cyprus, passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. Um, remember, Paul was rushing. He was trying to get to Jerusalem before the Passover. So he was moving along. He was trying to make his way there as quickly as possible. So he goes to, he goes to uh, Tyre, finding the disciples there. So he was looking for some Christians. He stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. They were like, Paul, no, don't go there. Don't go. Bad stuff is going to happen to you if you go to that city. But, by, but when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. A really cool little picture right here. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city. I mean, can you just see this picture? Sitting on a beach kneeling down and praying. Very, very cool. Verse 7, we continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. So, man, just, just boom, 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 going from one place to another. We reached Caesarea, stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody, Philip the Evangelist? So, so way, way, way back, first part of Acts, the church is growing. It's getting bigger, and there, were, there was a division between the Hebrew widows and the Greek widows. 
There was a battle because the, the, the Greek widows who were of a lesser class than the Hebrew widows were complaining. They were saying, hey, why are they getting taken better care of than us? So there was a little racism involved there in that. And so the disciples said, hey, you know what? We're not going to be able to take care of all these people, all these widows, and do our job of preaching the gospel. So let's pick some people, seven deacons, seven guys, who will do the job of waiting tables, of taking care of all of these widows so that they can be taken care of. Philip was one of those seven. Well, since Philip's ministry got so big that he ended up ministering in other places. He had a, there's a story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch where he's ministering to that guy and he ends up baptizing him. And this is one of the coolest stories in the Bible, I think. As he's baptizing him and they come up out of the water, Philip disappears. He's gone. And he ends up like 30 miles away in another town. Just kind of like Star Trek transported from one place to another. Just a new spot. So this is the Philip. So from all we can understand about him before, he was not with a family, but now he ends up... Now this is, remember, this is about 20... Let's see. Uh, this was, let's see, 33. So this was like... This is like 35 years later. No, 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 25 years later. See, I told you I was from California. I can't add. And so, so 25 years later from the time that Jesus was walking on the planet. So this is, this is him now, older, married, got four daughters. Four daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, so I was trying to figure out what this would have liked now. Now, this belt was probably uh, just a piece of cloth. In fact, I tried to, I tried to figure out what this might have looked like, and so here's a little, here's a little uh, something to help you maybe uh, see what this might have looked like. Piece of <laughs> okay, roll it back, roll it back, roll it back, roll it back. You got to hear it from the beginning. Got to turn that Sing volume way up. I keep my pants. Sing the song. I keep my pants up with a piece of wine. <laughs> I keep my pants up with a piece of wine. Okay. So that was climbing Mount Sherman one day. My grandson Connor's pants kept falling down. And so I got a piece of twine, and I wrapped that up. And the guy that I was with thought he would be Johnny Cash and sing, and sing that song. And so anyway, so that's, what would, that's the belt that Agabus would have used. So, so he, <laughs> you got to picture this. He takes Paul's belt off of him. So, so he takes this off of him, wraps somehow, wraps up his hands, and wraps up his feet. So I was trying to... Uh, Believe it or not, I tried to do this. I tried to see what this might have looked like. Everybody, it's really hard to do. Can I just say that this is really hard to do? So, so he says, he says, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So Agabus is prophesying. He's talking to Paul and saying, look, this is what is going to happen to you if you go there. When we, so we, so this is now Luke and some other people, when we heard this, we and the people who there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. And Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So just like Jesus went there, willing to die, willing to die for us, Paul is saying, look, I, I need to go there. And what's, what's fascinating about Agabus, the first time we read about him in Acts, he's prophesying about a famine that is going to come to Jerusalem later, like we're talking decades later. Well, what's fascinating is Paul right now is carrying the offering 
that he collected for the famine that was happening in Jerusalem right then. So he's meeting up with Agabus again. And just like he prophesied before about this famine, that he's carrying the offering back to Jerusalem, Agabus is there saying, hey, look, don't go there. They're going to tie you up. And Paul's like, I'm going. You aren't going to stop me. When he would not be dissuaded, he gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. After this, we got ready and we went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Mason, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus, one of the early disciples. So just to remind you again, it was Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas was from Cyprus. Barnabas was the one who introduced Paul to the church and said, hey, look, this is a good dude. So very well could be that this guy Mason, or Manason, depending on how you want to say his name, this guy Mason was uh, a, a early disciple, probably influenced by Barnabas there. So, a couple of little things that I was thinking about with this. The first one is, is thinking about community and the joys that come with community. So back in verse 4, there, you know, this church couldn't have been much. It couldn't have been very big. Finding the disciples there. But w- oh, verse 5, I should say. But when our time was up, we left, continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied them out to the city. There on the beach, they pl- prayed. So this church, this little church, this community comes together, thanks Paul, greets him, sends him on his way, just says, look, we love you, we thank you, be blessed. So this is a church sign that uh, I saw online one day. The danger of missing church is soon you won't miss it. The danger of missing church is that soon you won't miss it. Everybody, I have talked to more people in the past couple of months who have said to me, you know, I was really bummed when the quarantine hit and we had to stay home. And, you know, we we stopped coming to church. Man, we missed it so much. We missed church. We missed you. We missed all the people. And, you know, I've kind of gotten used to just staying home on Sunday morning. And there's, there's, there's kind of this derogatory term now that's pajama Christians. People on Sunday morning, rather than getting up and doing the thing that they used to do before, instead are watching church online, which is totally fine. That's okay. But the thing that breaks my heart is I'm hearing people say, you know, I... I don't know that I really need to go to church. I don't, I don't, and it's caused me to be kind of snarky and, and, and kind of query them and say, well, why did you go before? You know, well, what was it about it before that was so intriguing, but now it's not so intriguing anymore? Here's something very, very interesting about spiritual things. The, 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 the difference between being hungry physically and hungry spiritually work exactly the opposite. When you're hungry physically, what do you do? You eat. When you are hungry spiritually, usually we don't eat. When we are not around Christians, when we are not in community, when we are not around people who we associate with or went to church with, it just kind of starts to fade away and you start thinking, man, I don't, I, I don't need that anymore. It is only when you dive into Scripture, dive into reading your Bible, attend a group of some sort, that you get hungry for more. It's really, really ironic how that works. But when you're, when you're in a situation where, you know, this, this, this church stuff is Christians, I, 
you know what? I'm just finding that I don't, that I don't need it. And everybody, that is very, very sad to me. Very, very sad that that's the case. And I would say applaud to you, kudos to you for being here today because you're saying, man, no matter what, man, I want to be in community. I want to be with people. I want to be in the, in the church. I want to be in, in the house of God. I want, to, I want to sing with people. I want to grow. I want to know the Bible a little bit better. Just because we took Bible out of our church name doesn't mean that we are still reading and studying and getting to know this thing intimately. Amen. The second thing that I kind of pondered about this section is having firm resolve. Paul was not deterred from completing the task that he was set out to complete. Twice in this story, he was, I wouldn't say he was almost talked out, but people tried to talk him out of going to Jerusalem. They were like, no, man, don't go. So it caused me to think about something. So this guy Agabus says in verse 11, the Holy Spirit says, well, Paul was saying, well, yeah, well, the Holy Spirit said to me, so you have a clash of people who are saying, well, the Holy Spirit said to me, well, the Holy Spirit said to me. Well, here's the first thing. We need to be very, very careful even saying the Holy Spirit said. We need to be careful with that. Well, the Lord said. Well, the Lord told me. Oh, yeah, well, the Lord told me. I think we got a... There was a a book by John Bevere years ago called uh, The Take... uh, Shoot, this is... The fear of the Lord, I think it was the fear of the Lord. And in it, he talked about taking the Lord's name in vain. And one of the ways that we take the Lord's name in vain, it's not by cussing. One of the ways we take the Lord's name in vain is by saying, thus saith the Lord. Or the Lord told me. So we have to really be careful when we say that. Now, we can have unction. We can have a feeling. We can have a notion. We can't we can say, man, the Holy Spirit is really impressing on me. And yeah, you can have that internally, but once we say it, it changes the game. If I say, well, the Lord said, well, are you going to, are you going to say, well, the Lord lied to you? No. Or are you going to say, well, how, how do you know? So you, so it's, it's, it's tricky. So if we're going to say the Lord said or the Holy Spirit says, man, you, you probably should know pretty well, don't you think? You probably should know. So here we have a kind of a, a battle of, of, the, of the, the Holy Spirit says going on here. So who, who's going to win? So you got <laughs> two different sides. Well, if you look at it, If you really look at it more closely, I don't know that Agabus was necessarily saying, don't go, as much as he was saying, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen when you do go. But think about our lives for just a second, though. So what do we do when we we have that? Well, the Lord said this and one to one, and the Lord said this to the other. I would say pray about it. Pray, pray. Say, okay, Father, well, this person says the Lord told me, and I say the Lord told me, and they're, in, and they're at odds with each other. Pray about it. Decide, okay, what's, what's, okay, what's, did one of us have bad pizza last night, or what's going on here? And then, you know, the other side of it is, is just, just keep driving forward with your plans, and then kind of maybe something will give or take one way or the other. And you know what? Don't get mad. That's the other thing. You know, it's nothing to get mad about. You know, you're at odds or you're trying to figure it out. That's that's not 
That's not the time to get upset. Something else that I thought about in this section was this idea of prophecy. So several times in this story is the idea of prophecy. Now, many of us have this idea that prophecy means just like what Agabus did, that such and such is going to happen. This, this thing is going to happen. And that is being prophetic. That is, that is foretelling what is going to happen in the future. Just like he said earlier, to like 25 years earlier, hey, there's going to be a famine. Same thing. Now, when you think about an Old Testament prophet, the Old Testament prophets didn't foretell very much. Basically, what they did was they just told people, hey, you need to obey God. And if you don't, then the judgment that God was going to enact because of your disobedience is going to happen. So turn, repent, change. That's really more about what prophecy is all about. But here's the, here's the big thing that, that encouraged me, and that, and that is this idea of using our gifts. Friends, if, you, if the Lord has given you a gift, use it. Whatever it is, whatever gift God has given you, use it. Don't just let it be stagnant. Don't just let it sit. Make use of it. The fourth thing. Were these guys, Philip, Agabus, and Mason, three people mentioned in this story who were long-time friends of Paul and possibly some other people that were traveling there with, with Paul, people that they'd known for a long time. Philip, way, way, way back. Agabus, way back. Mason was way back, and, and who knows how it worked out that they got to hang out together. But these were people that knew each other for years and years and years. This is a little bit of a, just a, a mark, just kind of a think about something. When Luke wrote Luke and Acts, he didn't come onto the scene until about Acts 16. And what he did was he, he carefully investigated. If you read the beginning of Luke, he says that he, he interviewed eyewitnesses. He talked to different people. So he was not around when Philip did his things with the widows. So I was wondering, is this where he met Philip for the t- first time, heard about that, and then spent some time talking to him to get the story straight? Just a... Just kind of a weird Markism the other day. I was thinking that, thinking that through. So here's my, here's my challenge for you today. Here's the thing that I would like to encourage you all to do. Catch up. Catch up with your seventh grade friends. Catch up with somebody that maybe you went to high school with. So I told you about my friend Ken that, that came by our house uh, about a month ago or so. I want to tell you two others really fast. So my friend Bob just found out a couple of probably two months ago that his wife has a kind of a cancer, um, melanoma of the liver or something like that. Very, very low survival rate. So he called me up one day uh, a couple months ago and and just wanted to share that with me, that there was a really low percentage chance of his wife being healed from that. And just, just <laughs> wanted to know what to do. My wife's going to die. What do, what do I do? And it was interesting because <laughs> the first thing I said was travel. Go, go. So right after that, they, they, they booked uh, a trip to Europe somewhere, Italy or something. They're going to go. And then they were going to go on a cruise somewhere, somewhere else. But he said, yeah, okay, so we're going to take advantage of this. 
And I tried to call him when I was thinking about all of this. I tried to call him last week and didn't get a chance to talk to him. But I'm going to catch up with him and find out how he's doing. It's kind of cool because every once in a while he'll send me a text. He's, a, he's the mountain biking coach at the high school that we went to. So he graduated from that high school. You know, 30 years later, now he's back as the mountain biking coach at that school, sewing back into that, into that space. And then the other one, um, the other one is my friend Jeff. And Jeff called me uh, several months ago and had some stuff going on in his life, and I haven't followed back up with him, so I'm going to call him again. And I'm going to just find out how Jeff's doing. So that's, this, is my, this is my encouragement to you today, is catch up with some of these old friends. See if there's somebody in your life that you can call or you can just connect with and, and see what's going on in their life. You can pray for them. You can encourage them. You can bless them in some way. But take some time to, to connect with some people that are old friends. Because, man, you can never, you can never replace that that was birthed that many years ago. And some of them are just treasures, some of those situations. So I want to encourage you all to do that this week. All right, well, thanks, Mark. That's the official do challenge of the week. We try to have every single, ser- uh, every single Sunday having some step that we can take together to live beyond ourselves, to put into practice what we're hearing. And I just want to encourage you, um, we won't spend a lot of time, that's a pretty simple one, Uh, it doesn't take too much planning, just find a friend uh, or allow God to place someone on your heart, follow up with them, pray with them. But I just want to encourage you uh, why we're doing this, why we're taking a step. So when we come on a Sunday morning, we, we come to encounter God in worship, a living God, right? When we open the text, when we read the Bible, the Bible says it's living and active, Right, So it's not, it's not like when we're traveling, if we go uh, view like architecture or statues and we say, wow, look at the beauty of this. That's not what it's like when we're worshiping God. It's, it's, he's living. He's, he's our God who wants to engage with us. Same thing with a text. It's not like we're just looking at history or we're gaining some sort of knowledge. But this is God's message to us that he wants to work through it into our lives. And so we should have an expectation that not just are we going to gain something from this, but we're also going to be doing something from this, that God is going to be working through the text. God is going to be working through the worship. When we are encountering him, he is going to mold us to be more like him. So there is an aspect every time that we're coming, if we're coming genuinely before God, that he, he will be moving us to be the people that he wants us to be. And so that's why we want to demonstrate what that looks like every Sunday on a Sunday morning, that there would be a step that we would take allowing God to move through us. So when we do this, when we call up our friend, do it with a posture of saying, Lord, I want you to mold me into the person that you want me to be. If this is the the step we want to take as a church from reading this text, I'll allow you to come in to me and let me become the person you want me to be. God doesn't care about our knowledge, about having all of this. He wants us to become different kinds of people people in the world, people that can, can demonstrate who he is so that he might know everyone. And then also, I want to invite you to our do uh, one week in advance. Next week, next Sunday, we have a very special Sunday that we're coordinating. There's a church that meets in here every Sunday evening. Uh, they are a bilingual church in both English and Spanish, and we're going to have a combined service next week. So it's going to be a little bit different for all of us, but in the same vein as what we read about Paul jumping into these Christian communities in places that he hadn't seen in a long time or doesn't know, we're going to all be coming together and worshiping. Uh, We're we're letting uh, both worship teams, both pastors be able to have a moment to share a little bit about here's how we worship God. So we're going to experience that all together in different ways next week. And then we're, we're going to have uh, a meal together, but we got to share it outside uh, just to make sure that we've got uh, nice um, conditioning with the, with the air moving, moving through. But I invite you to come next week uh, to practice worshiping God in unity with people, Christians, 
who, are, uh, who worship God in different ways than we do. It's going to be a very exciting time. Uh, but those are the, kind of the two challenges. This week, call up a friend and then join us next Sunday uh, for a very special service. Uh, no, not a potluck, and I don't think we're allowed to bring stuff, you know, to share, you know, with all that stuff. We're going to have a, another food truck um, just to be able to, they'll prepare everything. It'll be great. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that everyone can enjoy that time uh, together with a challenge to try to get to know uh, people that perhaps you have no clue what you have in common except the blood of Jesus, right, and that we're following him. That's, that's why. Would you bow your, your heads and your hearts with me as we go out this week? Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for you. Uh, we thank you that you care about us. We thank you for your love that you demonstrated uh, all throughout history, that we can read all through the text of the Bible and in our lives. We ask that we would see you more, that we would experience you more, Lord, that you would fill us up in order that we might share that with others around us. So lead us this week, Lord. Lead us to the people that you want us to follow up with. I pray that you would be in that, you would be able to speak through us, and that you could minister through us in order that they might be able to, to feel your presence, to feel your love through our interactions. I pray also for this service that we're doing with Cornerstone Church uh, next week, Lord. I pray that that would be a joyful time for all of us. Um, I pray that it would be an offering that we can give back to you uh, where you can smile and see your children uh, worshiping together in harmony, harmony and in the unity that you've, brought, you've bought with your blood, Lord. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. All right, go this week and sharing God's love beyond yourself.